All right, welcome to the screencast on blood. Uh, this one should be relatively quick. It is a short chapter, uh, and there's a lot of overlap with what we're learning in lab. Um, so we, we can go through it kind of quickly because we're learning it two different ways. Uh, these first couple of slides, we can just skip right over um, because they are not in the objectives and not on the exam. So the objectives start here with blood composition. Um, really, the important thing to know here is the pH between 7.35 and 7.45, uh, relatively narrow pH range. You just want to keep that in mind. Then we move on to hematocrit, which is also in the lab, but I'll mention it here too. So hematocrit is a way to measure how many red blood cells are in your bloodstream specifically is, is measuring the percentage of your total blood volume that is made up of red blood cells. So if this is 100%, um, then you measure whatever your hematocrit is, um, and the percentages for males and females are up there. Um, I, I apologize, the lecture powerpoints give a, an average with a plus or minus and the lab guide which i did not write um, hence the inconsistency gives a range but they're the range given by the lab guide and this range given here are the same they're just presented a little bit differently um, but i'm more likely to ask you about those these two numbers here um, and not the range that is given in the lab, because I think it's just easier to remember one number, um, and I don't keep in mind the plus or minus five. Okay, and then plasma, uh, you just basically want to know what's in plasma, this slide and that slide. Uh, there's not a ton to explain. The one thing I will um, expound on just a little bit is urea. This is one of your body's major major nitrogenous byproducts, which means it contains nitrogen. Um, this is so because any of the protein that you eat, right, gets broken down into all of the individual amino acids. Some of those amino acids your body uses to make its own proteins, but if you eat more protein than you actually need, then you end up burning the amino acids for energy the same way you might burn glucose but nitrogen doesn't fit into any of the um, respiration, cellular respiration, biochemical pathways. So before an amino acid can be turned into CO2 and ATP, it has to be deaminated. Uh, that nitrogen containing amine group has to be removed and that's why you have urea or this nitrogenous waste product. Uh, let's see, so the rest of the stuff, just know it's in there. This stuff, just know it's in there. Electrolytes, you can probably guess what some of the electrolytes might be, like our friends, sodium and potassium and calcium. Um, those are the big three. Respiratory gases, you can probably guess. Oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then hormones from the chapter that we just finished. So now we are on to the formed elements. We call them formed elements because these little platelets down here are not actually cells. They are cytoplasmic fragments of larger cells that stay in the bone marrow. Um, so that is why instead of saying blood cells, we say formed elements. Uh, and we're just going to work our way through them, starting with erythrocytes. So their major function is to carry oxygen. That's what you want to keep in mind if you are identifying an erythrocyte, uh, either the model or the microscopic slide from lab. We go into a little bit more detail about how they work in the lecture portion. Um, so the shape by concave just means if you look at it from the side, they kind of look like this, right, where there's a divot in the middle on either side. What this does is give them a very good surface area to volume ratio. That means that 
any hemoglobin that is carrying oxygen is never very far away from the surface. Now, so you want to contrast that with imagine that you just inflated the same cell and took out the divots. Here, if you're hemoglobin right there in the middle, you're not that far away from the surface. So oxygen can diffuse in and out. But if you're a hemoglobin in the middle of that cell, you're much farther away from the surface. So that's why you get that biconcave shape. Um, also, uh, red blood cells have dumped all of their organelles. They do not have a nucleus, so they are basically sacs of hemoglobin with this specialized shape so that they can carry as much oxygen as possible. For hemoglobin, you want to know what its structure is. Um, it is the fully mature form of the protein has, if you recall from AP1, quaternary structure, which means multiple amino acid chains are assembled together or multiple peptides are assembled together to make the mature protein. So you have four peptide chains. In the middle of each peptide chain is a heme. Is it labeled? Yeah, there's the heme. So there's your one, two, three, four hemes. And then there's an iron in the center of each heme. So each hemoglobin has four irons on the four hemes, which means it can transport four molecules of oxygen. This will become important when we go over the respiratory system and talk about the relationship between hemoglobin and oxygen, because the, the oxygenation status of all of the hemes affects each other. Uh, let's see, this slide we're just gonna skip. It's terminology that I never ask you about. It's, I'm trying to keep to a minimum the number of new words you need to learn. Um, so we're, we're still talking about red blood cells and we wanna talk about red blood cell production. But before we talk specifically about how red blood cells are made, we need to talk generally about how blood cells are made. So whether it's a red blood cell or a white blood cell or a platelet, we call it hematopoiesis. This takes place in the red marrow, which you probably remember from Anatomy and Physiology 1. And all of your formed elements are derived from the same stem cell, the hemocytoblast. So this thing right there is that thing right there. So if you look down here, right, these are all... Let me get the cursor right. These are all of your different formed elements, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, and they're all ultimately derived from a hemocytoblast. So a uh, hemocytoblast is an example of an adult stem cell. If you've followed any of the adult versus fetal stem cell debate, which people haven't really been talking about lately, or it's not been in the popular press. At any rate, um, so you have this one stem cell, and then depending on which hormonal factor or growth factor it is exposed to, that determines what developmental route it's going to take. And then this slide I just should have deleted and didn't. So now erythropoiesis specifically, this is red blood cell production. It is a Greek word. Um, a lot of A and P is a combination of Greek Latin, and then a smattering of all of these other languages thrown together. Um, so it is under the control or stimulated by the hormone erythropoietin or EPO. It is produced by the kidney uh, and the signal that the kidney tracks to produce erythropoietin is hypoxia. Um, so it's hypo, which means something is low and oxia, so you can probably guess that hypoxia is low oxygen levels. So what you wanna remember when you're talking about hypoxia is that it is um, more of a symptom and not necessarily a root cause, right? So hypoxia simply means that a given tissue doesn't have enough oxygen in it. And this could be lack of blood flow to a tissue, like when your arm falls asleep because you slept on it wrong or it could be lack of O2 in the bloodstream, um, either because something is wrong with your red blood cells, or maybe you're just at altitude. Um, for whatever reason, 
either your whole body or a given tissue isn't getting enough oxygen, and that's hypoxia. So your red blood cells do not last forever, and you have a lot of them. So there's kind of a specialized process to deal with getting rid of all of the dead red blood cells that are floating around in your bloodstream. This is a possible open-ended question on the exam, and you basically just want to be able to regurgitate those four bullet points. So you have macrophages, which are phagocytes in your spleen that and digest your dead red blood cells. The iron is then shipped off to the liver where it's stored and eventually sent back to the bone marrow. It just gets reused to make more hemoglobin. The heme is degraded and ends up being turned into a bile pigment called bilirubin. Um, this is why your feces are the color that your feces are. It is bilirubin that gives them that distinct color. Um, and then the globin, right, which is just the peptide chains, is broken down into a individual amino acids, and then those are just recycled into other proteins. Next up, erythrocyte disorders. So we're going to have a bunch of different kinds of anemia. I wouldn't spend too much time studying the anemia, but you do want to be familiar with it. Um, so anemia specifically refers to low oxygen carrying capacity in the bloodstream. So anemia would be one cause of hypoxia. Right? You could be hypoxic because your blood can't carry oxygen. But again, there, there are multiple reasons why you might be anemic and you want to be familiar with that. So you might be anemic because you don't have enough red blood cells. Hemorrhagic just means you're bleeding out. Hemolytic means your red blood cells are dying for whatever reason. Um, maybe it's a... Oh, I can't think of it now. Malaria would cause anemia in sickle cell disease, but we'll get into that later. Um, and then aplastic anemia means you're not making enough red blood cells. Uh, you could have inadequate iron in your diet, so you can't make enough hemoglobin, or there could be something wrong with your hemoglobin. Um, so this is specifically referred to as thalassemia. The one thalassemia that we will name specifically is sickle cell anemia. So this happens when there's one amino acid that gets changed in the globin chain of your hemoglobin. One of the amino acids is wrong. That changes the entire shape of the protein and also changes the entire shape of the cell. So they take on this sickle shell, sickle shape, which is why it's called sickle cell anemia. Now, this change in the shape of the cell makes them less adept at diffusing oxygen in and out. And the change in the shape of the hemoglobin makes it less good at carrying oxygen. Also, this shape makes the cells a little bit more brittle, so they're more likely to break apart and die. So all of that leads to a greatly decreased oxygen carrying capacity if you have sickle cell anemia. So now we are on to our white blood cells. The first thing that you wanna be able to do is list, should I ask you on the exam, your granulocytes and your agranulocytes. And the granulocytes are called granulocytes because they have granules or clumps of protein. So these are not organelles, but uh, protein assemblies that are big enough to actually see. Um, and they get their name from their appearance and how they stain. So your three granulocytes, basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, and then your agranulocytes, which lack lymphocytes. Um, just a couple of general terms to know about leukocytes. Um, and these two are not in the objectives, but I still want you to know them. Uh, first up is this term called diapedesis. That's what they're showing you here. This is where white blood cells attach to the blood vessel wall, crawl out, and then migrate towards an infection or a site of damage. So this is not just 
cells are under pressure or blood is under pressure and there's a little hole and the cell gets squirted through the hole. This is an active adaptation that the cells take on where they attach to the blood vessel wall and intentionally, even though cells don't have will and intention, right? But they do actively move out of the blood vessel into the surrounding tissues. Um, I bring it up and I like to point it out because this is an example of a capability that your cancer cells take on, right? So if cancer is going to become malignant or uh, what's the word we're looking for, metastatic and spread from one area of the body to the other, it needs to be able to get into a blood vessel or a lymphatic vessel and then crawl out somewhere else. And this just highlights that a lot of the characteristics that your cancer cells take on are positive adaptations that other cells have developed, but it's bad in cancer because it's the wrong cell doing the wrong thing at the wrong place and time. Um, and it's one of the big reasons why cancer is so hard to defeat because one, it comes from within the body. So your body is not as adept at recognizing it as it would an infection. And then two, all of the things that cancer cells do are normal functions within the body. So if you target or develop drugs that target the cancer, there's always going to be side effects because they're your cells and they're doing things that you want other cells in your body to be able to do. So it's really hard to kill or chemically inhibit a tumor without also causing problems in other parts of the body or other cell populations. Um, so that little diatribe over, we will talk about leukocytosis um, is just mitosis in your leukocytes. So you end up with an elevated white blood cell count. Now we are on to our individual white blood cells. Neutrophils are first. Um, I will just say they are called neutrophils because the granules in the cytoplasm absorb a pH 7 stain or a neutral stain. I forget the name of it. Um, so it, the granules stain the same color as the rest of the cytoplasm because they absorb the same stain so you can't see them. Uh, the reason why they're sometimes called polymorphonuclear cells or polymorphonuclear leukocytes is because the nucleus takes on different shapes in different neutrophils. And you're going to see this in the lab where no, true, no two neutrophils look quite the same. Um, so what your neutrophils do is kill and phagocytize bacteria. They kill the bacteria with enzymes and these other proteins called defensins which poke holes in the membrane of the bacteria and they're great big non-specific holes. So the bacteria loses its ability to control where the water goes and ions and all this stuff and that kills the bacteria. And then the neutrophil basically just cleans up the corpse. Then you have eosinophils. Uh, their granules stain red because they absorb a stain called eosin. It is named after Eos, the Greek god of the sun. It has nothing to do with physiology, but it's just fun to know this stuff. Eosinophils digest, presumably with hydrolytic enzymes or digestive enzymes, parasitic roundworms, thus, as this says right here, are too large to be phagocytized. Don't worry about how they modulate the immune response. But basically, all of your white blood cells are what compose your immune system and they all communicate with each other, so they all are modulators of the immune response in one way, shape, or form. Basophils are called basophils because their granules absorb this very dark purple stain called basic fusion. So it is alkaline or basic in pH and purple, and this is where they get their color and their name. What you want to know about the basophils is that they release histamines, which is part of the inflammatory process. And I will just say now, when we get to the immune system, we'll talk about inflammation. Right now, we want to think of inflammation as a positive adaptation. 
If you have an infection, inflammation will help you fight it. It's just that our bodies tend to overinflame, and there are side effects of the inflammation that are bad. So we'll, I'll keep moving. Next up, lymphocytes. I don't want to spend a lot of time on lymphocytes because we're going to have a whole chapter on the immune system. We will talk more about the lymphocytes. Uh, you have two different kinds, T cells and B cells. Um, and there's multiple kinds of T cells. They do a lot. We're just going to think of them as being your body's primary weapon against viruses. And then your B cells produce antibodies. That's all we want to know. Then you have monocytes. They're in the bloodstream, they're called monocytes. These are the cells that are most likely to leave the bloodstream. And then when they're out of the bloodstream, we call them macrophages. So you're going to see a bunch of different examples or times when we refer to macrophages, and you want to remember that those are monocytes. So there are macrophages in your lungs, in your liver, um, where else? Lungs, liver, spleen. Um, all of your lymphatic organs, like your tonsils and your lymph nodes, all have macrophages in them that are digesting viruses and bacteria or dead red blood cells. Any physical object that you don't want to have in your bloodstream, or excuse me, outside of your bloodstream, um, your monocytes take. White blood cell production is called leukopoiesis. Um, this is obviously complicated because there's five different um, so we're not going to go into any of the details. You simply want to know that there are two families of signaling molecules that direct white blood cell production. And they are interleukins and colony stimulating factors. And I'm going to introduce one word now so that I don't forget to later, um, which is cytokine. And I'm probably never going to ask you what it is, but you might read about it. So cytokine is the big name for any kind of chemical that white blood cells and other parts of your immune system use to communicate with each other. So that's the big umbrella term. And interleukins and colony stimulating factors would both be examples of cytokines. So if you see that word, um, that's the big umbrella term, and then underneath it is more specific terms like interleukins. But even this you can see, right? Interleukins is a family of signaling molecules that white blood cells use to communicate with each other. It gets super complicated really quick, so we'll move on. Uh, let's see. I'm probably not going to ask you about this because we only have so much time and we want to focus on homeostasis, so let's just skip that. Um, let's see. Moving on then, platelets. Oh, we're almost done with the chapter. So for platelets, uh, you just want to know these three bullet points. Uh, they are small cytoplasmic fragments, as you can see here. So this cell here, the megakaryocyte, that's going to stay in your bone marrow, and then little pieces of it bud off or pinch off exit the bone marrow. Those are your platelets. Platelet production is under the control of a hormone called thrombopoietin. Um, so it jumps in pretty early in the developmental pathway and causes the myeloid stem cell to become a megakaryocyte. And the function of the platelets, as this says right here, is to form a platelet plug, um, which is the first step in hemostasis. This I'm going to skip because it is expounded on here, and that is just a slide that I probably meant to delete but forgot to. Uh, so this is a possible open-ended question. You just want to be able to under, excuse me, explain hemostasis. There's three steps, vascular spasm, platelet plug formation, and coagulation, and it's pretty well explained here. So if you get a break in a blood vessel, the smooth muscle in the blood vessel wall will constrict. That narrows the diameter of the blood vessel or the radius so that less blood can leak out of it. Then the platelets are going to stick to the damaged blood vessel wall because you've exposed connective tissue. 
and then the platelets stick to the connective tissue. They release chemicals that attract other platelets, so more platelets show up and you get a temporary plug. Uh, then that leads to coagulation, which is the formation of a clot. And you do want to keep plug and clot separate. They sound the same and they perform the same function, but the clot is different and is a somewhat sturdier structure than the platelet plug. It is going to stay longer and is mechanically sounder. This is again something I should have just. So now we are on to coagulation. This I have divided up into two possible open ended questions. One is to just explain the two processes that can initiate this whole coagulation pathway. So you have an intrinsic pathway and an extrinsic pathway. The intrinsic is called intrinsic because it starts with the blood vessel itself. And it's damage to the blood vessel wall, which causes the platelets to stick to it. And then the platelets release chemical factors platelet factor three is what PF3 stands for, that initiates this side of the biochemical pathway. But you can see that these two pathways here don't intersect um, with each other. They run parallel or they intersect right here. So the intrinsic pathway is one way to get to here and the extrinsic pathway is another way to get to here. And extrinsic just means it is not related to damage to the blood vessel. Um, but again, like if you cut your skin, you're rupturing lots of cells that are not blood vessels. And anytime a cell spills its guts, um, your body responds with inflammation and coagulation. It always just um, responds to cell rupture as a possible physical insult to the body. Uh, then here's where things get a little bit trickier and where the Pearson book, which we used to use, and this OpenStax book, which we're now using, use a little bit different language. And even their language up here is a little different. So I've included both. This uh, red starburst right here is supposed to represent an enzyme called prothrombinase or a prothrombin activator. That is the point at which these two pathways meet. So they, they are two different ways to get to the formation of this enzyme. And that this enzyme is what triggers this pathway down here. Um, and this is then your second essay question, possible essay question, is to explain this pathway. So you start with prothrombinase. Prothrombinase is an enzyme that is going to convert prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin is also an enzyme, and the reaction that it catalyzes is the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. So fibrinogen, as this says right here, is a soluble protein, so that means it floats around in the bloodstream and it doesn't stick to anything. Fibrin, which I have misspelled here, is insoluble. It doesn't want to be in the water. And when you have multiple copies of an insoluble molecule, they all stick to each other because they're trying to get out of the water or they're being excluded from the water. So all of the insoluble fibrin sticks to itself and other stuff like a spider web and forms a big goopy mess that we call um, so sort of the way you want to think of these enzymes, the analogy I use is that if you go to the store and they have like a battery operated toy or one of those like flashlight keychain things, but there's a little plastic tab in or under the power button. So you push the power button and nothing happens so that the battery isn't drained before the item gets sold. That's how you want to think of prothrombin and fibrinogen, where the two proenzymes are the thing with the little plastic tab so that you can't turn the flashlight on. And what prothrombinase does is remove the tag from prothrombin so that it can activate. And then thrombin 
removes a little plastic tab from fibrinogen so that it can become fibrin and do what it does. The reason why you have these cascades like this is so that you can have a lot of potentially active enzymes waiting to do their job. And then once the signal goes off up here, all you have to do is make minor modifications to all of these enzymes, which is a lot faster than manufacturing something. And with that, I will stop. That is the blood chapter in just over 30 minutes.